Welcome to our webinar series at Charmaine Hammond, and we are delighted to have you here. We're just going to give a moment here for people to be coming into the webinar room. Uh, I've got some incredible guests for you today. That I'm going to introduce. So as you know, this is part of our Prep Online weekly series, weekly Wednesday series. A, a series that prep skills developed to help parents maximize their children's learning potential. And today's topic is around college planning for student athletes. I know we're fielding a lot of questions through prep skills from parents and student athletes, uh, high school counselors and athletic directors. So this is an important topic today and we are just so honored that we have three incredible guests to help us answer the many questions that are coming forward. So the hosts today are myself, Charmaine Hammond, and Joanna. I've worked for many, many years actually with families, with educational institutions, and uh, am delighted to be part of the Prep Skills uh, team. And Joanna is the founder and CEO of Prep Skills, which is an incredible organization located in Toronto, but that works with high school students and guidance counselors and athletic directors right across Canada, as well as working with US colleges and universities. We have many students that are wanting to pursue their education in the US and Joanna helps uh, facilitate that process. So Joanna, did you wanna add anything that I've missed about prep skills? Sure, uh, I've been an educator for over 25 years and um, mother of three young boys, <laughs> ages 14, 11 and 8, so busy household uh, now for sure. And at Prep Skills, what we do is we help students find their future. So primarily at the transition stages, so students who are moving from elementary or middle school to high school and high school to post-secondary. So that's uh, really what we do is our passion is helping students find theirs. Wonderful. Thank you. And we've got some incredible guests today. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our guests to you. And, and this group combined, all three of our guests, bring you years and years of knowledge and we'll be able to answer your questions. We had a lot of questions actually come in before the webinar. So we'll be starting with up some of those. We are recording this webinar, so you'll be able to watch it and listen to it later. And we'll be checking in the chat box to see if questions are coming in. Uh, if we can't answer them all today, we will make sure that we get the answers out to you. So first, I would like to introduce Nicole. And Nicole Funderburg is the Director of International Recruitment and Marketing for Southern Utah University. And uh, she has been there 19 years in a variety of positions. She achieved her Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Southern Utah University. And she has a Master's as well in Educational Leadership and Policy. Nicole currently works with a team of individuals to coordinate the recruitment and marketing efforts that are focused on connecting students from around the world uh, with opportunities at SUU. She is proud of the campus diversity with students from 63 countries. Welcome, Nicole. And we also have Joseph Arnold with us. And Joseph is the Assistant Athletic Director for NCAA Compliance with Dartmouth College. He's worked with Collegiate Compliance for the last nine years. And among the duties that he has as the Assistant Athletic Director for Compliance, he's responsible for all the incoming initial and transfer student athletes, the camps, the clinics, the maintaining information on prospective student athletes regarding the NCAA Eligibility Center, assisting in the certification for practice, competition, and athletic aid. Wow, Joseph. <laughs> He's also uh, serving as a liaison to admissions and financial aid. He's had sports responsibilities as a supervisor for the men's and women golf team and men's and women's swimming and diving. So welcome, Joseph. And then we have Dan Danielle Wong. Danielle is the team lead of International Eligibility Services for the NAIA. And she has been with NAIA since 2012. Her background is in international academics and athletics. She is a member of 
AACRAO, which is the American Association of Collegiate Registrar, Registrars, I can never say that word, and Admission Officers, and she works closely with NAIA's sister organization. Welcome, Danielle. Well, we've, uh, this is a great panel that we have with us today, and, and I'm delighted to have your support in helping us answer these many questions that are coming up. So are we ready to dive in? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Joanna, I'm going to have you take it away with the first questions. Okay, great. Well, I, I know pre-COVID, uh, families and counselors and, and students in general have found the athletic recruitment process to be quite the challenge. Um, and so now uh, we need to take this post-COVID and unpack it so that we can help our student athletes uh, progress and and you know and find their their place uh, at the college level. So maybe we should start with the big picture of the difference between NCAA and NAIA eligibility. So Joseph. Oh um, well, first things first. Uh, thank you all for having us, and we appreciate the opportunity. I know for myself, being a former student athlete, now working in this industry, anytime I get the opportunity to speak with someone about navigating this process as complex as it is i'm all for it so thank you all for that um i would say the biggest things um as far as ncaa and, and nai is for the limited information that i know is more so kind of as it's geared towards specific uh philosophies and the model of academics as well as uh competitions um of course there are some resource disparities in there but i think the biggest thing is just the academic model and the principles um each institution has i know for uh, of course, our institutions are, are, are driven by athletics as them being the front door, front porches of their institutions. Um, and so a lot of uh, opportunities and resources are built around the successes of, excuse me, athletic programs. And um, those academic programs are, are geared really around those models, if you will. Um, outside of that, I, I wouldn't say there's too much of a, a big difference. Uh, competition levels. Competition is going to be competition no matter the level. Great. And in terms of eligibility criteria for NCAA? Uh, well, we, we really operate on a similar scale, similar sliding scale of, you know, having academic benchmarks as far as having core, credit, core course units and credit units in your English, maps, your sciences, other core courses as, such as foreign languages, things of that nature, having set uh, academic and GPA benchmarks by your sophomore, juniors, and senior years, um, specifically with uh, prospective student athletes coming into high school on this realm, you have to have 10 of your core course units completed by the, your, prior to your seventh semester. And then by the end of your um, academic experience, if you will, you have to have completed 16 core course units in English, math, science, and other core course areas. So those, those different benchmarks kind of differ from those of uh, the NAIA, and we're based on a sliding scale as far as your test scores, ACT, SAT, and, you know, differences in uh, amateurism aspects. Okay, great. Great. Danielle. All right. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, so, Joseph made a lot of good points. So, NAIA, uh, in comparison to NCAA, I would say the largest difference is the, the size of our schools. Uh, NAIA has 250 uh, current members, and we tend to be uh, smaller, sometimes private, sometimes uh, religiously affiliated uh, schools and institutions. Um, so a lot smaller student body overall, and therefore um, smaller uh, pool of, of athletes. And so uh, I would say some of the differences are um, in our championship sports, I'm not exactly sure how many championship sports NCAA has, uh, but NAIA, um, a few key differences on that front is our, our newest front is um, really starting to emerge and becoming popular, especially with the COVID-19 situation, uh, is e-games and e-sports. And mm -hmm. so while that's not considered a, a championship sport quite yet, uh, we are working with NACE, um, which is uh, essentially a, a national e-games association and they're housed within the NAIA. Uh, and we're starting for uh, several different um, programs. They're co-ed programs um, from school to school and actually to be uh, a member of NACE, you don't, it's not just uh, NAIA schools. So that's open to any school in the nation to form a team. 
Uh, a couple other championship sports that, Joseph, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think are different from NCAA between NAIA uh, is, well, men's and women's bowling. Does NCAA, they probably have bowling. Yes, we do have bowling. Okay. Um, uh, our newest ones are women's wrestling, uh, and we actually just released um, a press announcement this past week within the last few days. Uh, we're partnering with the NFL for uh, a flagship uh, women's flag football program. So we're excited mm -hmm. to see that, uh, as well as women's wrestling is what we've added uh, over this past year. And then um, I believe, again, <laughs> Joseph, uh, sorry if I don't have my details right. Um, we have a separate cheer championship and dance championship. Um, and we've had that, uh, ooh, I would estimate maybe four to five years now. Great. Um, as far as eligibility requirements, uh, they are similar to the NCAA. Uh, Joseph spoke about a sliding scale. Um, we don't use a sliding scale. Uh, for freshmen, we have um, basically two of three initial uh, eligibility requirements, and those are a high school GPA of 2.0. We convert um, any international grading systems over to the US 4.0 scale. Uh, a class rank in the top 50% of your graduating class and then qualifying ACT or SAT test score. So uh, entering freshmen just need to meet two of those three. Um, although we've made some exceptions for COVID that I think we'll talk about in a little while here. Uh, and then where NCAA has core high school classes where they um, take into consideration uh, for that freshman eligibility. Uh, we do not have um, core class requirements. We're just taking that cumulative high school GPA. Mm, interesting, good. Okay, well maybe we'll hear from Nicole. Nicole, can you help us uh, understand maybe what's happened as a result of, of COVID? Any changes in timelines or um, with respect to SAT, ACT scores? What school visits, that sort of thing? Yeah, so we've tried to reach out and do some of our school visits virtually um, since, you know, travel has been difficult. I just got an email from a student this morning um, saying, not from Canada, but saying, you know, they couldn't go in and apply for their visa because they were only taking emergency appointments at this point. So there is just a lot that's unknown right now. Um, we are planning to open face-to-face -face for fall, but that is also a decision that we'll have a confirmation at a later date when we're closer to that point. And so um, it's just so much up in the air, so much unknown right now for students. And I know that's really, really difficult to plan and it's unsettling, um, but we're moving forward. Our timelines, our deadlines, we have not We have a deadline of July 1st for international applicants. We haven't moved our deadline. That's really a deadline that has historically worked to um, kind of allow the visa process time. And so um, it's a pretty late deadline as it is. If we were to extend it any later, there probably wouldn't be time to get the visa. And so we haven't moved deadlines. Our process looks similar at this point for um, international student admissions, but it's just the, the other side of it, kind of that, the visa piece. Will the students be able to get interview appointments to obtain their visas and, and be able to come um, in time? and will campuses be open? There are just so many unanswered questions right now, so. Mm -hmm. And what do you look at specifically uh, in terms of international applicants? You're looking at their overall transcript. Mm -hmm. So from an international admission perspective, we are looking at their GPA and we, we do an in-house conversion of their GPA at SUU. Um, we are looking at proof of English proficiency. So we want to see that the students have a strong proof of English proficiency. We um, are looking at their financial situation, their financial ability to pay. Um, at SUU, we don't require the SAT or the ACT, but it can be taken. We don't require that for international students, but it can be taken as proof of English proficiency. Um, is SAT or ACT a requirement for NCAA? I'm assuming that it is. So probably our international athletes have that, but it's not a requirement of international admissions. Um, but that's the, the simple kind of picture that we're looking at is GPA, English proficiency, ability to pay. Um, Good. And what sports do you offer at Southern Utah? So we offer um, 
everything except our football is NCAA Division One, and I knew you were going to ask this, so I have it pulled up. <laughs> like 16, 16 different um, teams. We have men's basketball, men's cross country, men's football, golf, tennis, track and field, and then our women's sports are basketball, cross country, golf, gymnastics, soccer, softball, tennis, track and field, and volleyball. Great. Good, good, good. So Charmaine. Hey, here, here's a question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you see who wants to dive into this one first. So it's no surprise to any of us that the revenue for colleges and universities has been, um, you know, a real challenge. There's been canceled showcase events, canceled sporting events, another year of eligibility for those affected as seemingly fair solutions. And this has created a whole bunch of problems. I know that all of you are having to, to manage and to navigate through. Um, so, and then of course, rosters are ballooning with extra athletes. How is this all going to play out, do you think, um, with the cash crunch that's happening, with the talent crunch, what does this look like? <laughs> that's a big question, I know. <laughs> Who wants to take on that one first? I, mean, I, can, I can jump in real quick, just in terms right. of scholarships. We scholarship international students um, we work together with our coaches, with some of the sports that are funded fully by athletics. They have funding in place to fully fund their teams. But there are coaches that they work with our office to try to um, combine their offer with our offer. And I mean, at this point, we are not holding back like we're offering and being able to scholarship at like, you know, normal levels. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are on hiring freezes and purchasing freezes and, you know, things are really uncertain right now. But as, as far as scholarships and recruitment, this is always going to be a place where the university is going to invest. Um, and so I don't see any hold, holding back in that area right now. So I'll let Joseph and Daniel. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great answer. And I was just going to piggyback off of what she said. So our institution is different from uh, most institutions in the fact that we don't offer scholarships. More, We're more so a need-based uh, institution, but one of the things that our president, our provost, and our administration as a whole have has continued to guarantee that we will continue to support our students and our student athlete uh, population, regardless of what's going on in the world. Uh, the, one of our athletic director, Harry, he's he's been great in the sense that we will continue to uh, make decisions based on the well-being of our student athletes and our student uh, population as a whole. So, of course, there's been some cash crunch numbers, uh, certain professional. Oh, do we lose? Oh no! Right in the middle of a great answer. <laughs> trip. Uh -oh, froze up. I'm sorry. You froze up. That's okay. And we were there with bated breath for that answer. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm in rural New Hampshire, so I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, but just everything from official and unofficial visits, um, just you know, traditional budgeting. Everything has had to roll back and say, "Hey, where we are uh, at in this ac academic." you know, expenditures right now and where, where do we see ourselves? Of course, there have been hiring freezes. Of course, you know, bonuses, I'm sure we'll have to be on a standstill for right now, but we, we've been really placed in a, a fortunate position of, hey, whatever we need to do for the best interest of our student athletes, their health and well-being, mm -hmm. go out and do it. And we'll worry about it later, so. Great, and, and have the Ivy League colleges um, shifted their timelines in terms of admissions or you were looking at the, the May 1st decision date? So to my understanding, of course, they went forward with early decisions, those who were uh, in, in that realm, but there, there's been some, to my understanding, there's some flexibility because different uh, institutions are operating on different scales. So for example, at our institution, we're still on a quarter-based system, whereas other institutions are on a semester-based uh, system. So that, that decision may uh, allow for some flexibility. Okay. I'll just time in really quick. Um, my perspective is a little bit different, uh, different because I'm with the NAIA uh, national office, so I don't represent or work for any um, specific uh, member school. Um, but what I can tell you about the NAIA national office is that uh, obviously the COVID situation continues to evolve. Uh, what our date is right now uh, is July 1st. Uh, we're hoping to have a decision out by then on whether fall sports will move forward and small fall championships will still be in place. Um, we're, we're certainly uh, trying 
everything that we possibly can that uh, is in the safest measure possible to move forward with those fall sports and championships. But we're hoping uh, with our, our Council of Presidents, uh, National Eligibility Committee, uh, and other parties to all come together for a united decision for that July 1st date. Um, so our other membership schools are, are all school by school basis on how they're changing um, uh, or extending um, admissions and different things like that. Uh, what I can say uh, from the national office point of view is we have a, a very um, large project called Return on Athletics. Uh, it's kind of one of our, our pillars of our organization and that Return on Athletics really focuses on working with each school individually, um, a lot of data-driven um, decisions and recommendations for those student athletes and, and student body. Mm, thank you. And sort of building on, on where we're going with this conversation, um, there's so many decisions that families and student athletes are, are making just in regular times about the application process and where they're going to pursue their educational choices. And now, of course, um, families are navigating through all those choices, but in a situation where we're also dealing with um, the COVID-19 interruption. And I know that there's a lot of questions that families need to be asking. And we love to ask you, what questions should, what questions should parents be thinking about and asking right now in this new situation that we're living in? And, and I guess the other part of that question is, if international students are not able to travel right now, which of course is the case, so they're and you know, universities and colleges can't do their, their live campus tours and all the ways that they connect families to a particular educational institution. Um, what can we do to support them? I can jump in here quick. I mean, I would say we've got to take advantage of this, the technology that we have available to us and really tap into social media, um, anything, the school's website, they're you know, connecting with your admissions counselor to try to get enough information um, about the institution. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need to really look at um, you know, fit. What is going to be a good fit for you, um, whether that be, um, you know, the size of the community, um, I know here we are in kind of a rural part of Utah. We have a lot of fresh air, small class sizes, so a lot of benefits that we hope going into to, with the COVID situation um, kind of make us more appealing. Um, I think it's important to look at cost. It's important to look at like the bottom line, not just the tuition and your scholarship, but cost of living. So finding places to live where the cost of living um, fits in your budget. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's just important to, to really find an institution that has an environment that's going to help you to, to flourish as a student. Um, I'll let others kind of jump in, but those would be great. my first ideas and thoughts. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. And Danielle or Joseph, did you anyone want to add to that? Um, so I'll add uh, just on the international student front, um, with the COVID situation continuing to evolve, um, like Nicole mentioned earlier, I think a lot of our international students are kind of going to be uh, on that bubble on whether they can get that visa uh, done in time and they can secure their scholarships, their admissions, uh, and, and travel plans um, in a shorter amount of time and with certainly a higher level of uncertainty. Uh, so the biggest thing um, that I can recommend uh, for the NAIA uh, Eligibility Center, so getting uh, our international students uh, through and cleared uh, as eligible or not for the fall 2020 term uh, is working with our uh, sister organization, which um, I believe there's with my contact, uh, a link to the website, but NAIA um, first uh, works with a sister organization called NCRED, which is uh, International Credential Evaluations. So currently uh, we've been in operation for a, a few years uh, and myself and the international team work pretty closely with them. Uh, so it's currently an optional service, uh, not just for NAIA, um, NCAA, you don't just have to be a student athlete. Uh, it's, it's in the realm of uh, several different credential evaluation companies, WES and, and so forth. Um, so NAIA uh, works with NCRED and the way uh, 
transcripts are going with with the COVID situation. A lot of international students uh, are having a hard time getting those transcripts, and then I would say even probably a harder time with a with a hard copy and um, being able to mail and and get everything through on time. So what Incred offers uh, as where for uh, via post and hard mail, it would all have to be official school stamps sealed, etc. What Incred does with their um, cost and the credential evaluation uh, production is also authenticate and verify those records. So what that does is allow international students to uh, upload within their NCRED profile uh, unofficial documents to us. And that is one, we get it automatically. Uh, two, we have all records on file that we share between NCRED and the NAI Eligibility Center. So you're only sending your documents to NCRED. You don't have to send them to two places. Uh, and we would authenticate uh, and verify all documents and records. So even with, I would say, domestic and U.S. students um, kind of shifting to that electronic method more so than relying on post, I would say that's a, a big uh, a help for fall 2020 students to get through the process uh, much smoother and quicker. Good. Just to piggyback off of both of them, I think one of the two of the biggest things that everyone should pay attention to is and take advantage of is technology and ingenuity. You know, and Nicole said it best when it comes to technology, you know, our institutions are offering, you know, virtual campus tours. If you go on athletic websites, they're offering virtual uh, campus tours and you're able to, to get, a, get a good grasp of what the institution looks like. Of course, it's not going to replace, you know, physical uh, contact being on that actual institution, but it gives you a good picture. You can get the energy and vibe from that. But at the same time, technology allows for um, students, potential student athletes to go on their, on their institution's website, fill out those questionnaires, fill out surveys, whether it be an academic interest or whether it be an athletic interest. Um, use social media. You know, one of the big things on today is sending huddle videos or, or, or different academic transcripts or things of that nature on social media, on Twitter. You'd be surprised that especially during this era, um, coaches can't go out there and recruit and do certain things. So they've had to uh, use their ingenuity and recruit from their phone. But you'd be surprised a, a lot of institutions do that in the first place. So, you know, posting your links on um, social media. I uh, understand, be careful what you post on social media. But at the same time, that, that gives uh, coaches a, a good profile of, of who you are. At the same time, if you're a recruitable student athlete, if this is a recruitable peer, you can reach out to these coaches. Uh, they, their contact information is listed on websites. Reach out to them. Um, in that, understand that, you know, just because a school has certain colors or they have a certain record, doesn't mean you're a necessary fit for that institution. So understand what chemistry is all about. That's a big thing. And I, and I don't say that just from an athletic standpoint, because you're a student first. So go where, you know, where you best fit, where the energy is best. So where you can afford, where the teacher size, the teacher student athlete ratio is, uh, where your internship opportunities present themselves. You have to look at the bigger picture. Um, uh, aside from the athletic standpoint, you know, of being fiscally responsible, what can you afford? What can, you know, opportunities will be provided? Uh, because it's a long-term decision, it's an investment. So make sure that you're, you're looking at the bigger picture versus, you know, I, I want to play for this team because they have a good football team. So take advantage of your technology, you know, use your ingenuity, understand that these coaches are using the ingenuity, but don't be afraid to reach out. Good. I've got a um, teacher coach question here specifically uh, for the senior group. So seniors have been assured of graduating, but yet universities haven't necessarily relaxed their admission standards. Students who are looking to boost grades third term are left with the uncertainties of what grading will look like. Some student athletes bound for college uh, could probably see a prospective scholarship offer disappear. And is, is that a reality? And one parent in particular says that her uh, son is graduating this year and hasn't taken the SAT uh, due to COVID. And so what is, uh, what does she do? Do you want to get started with that? Uh, I can just a bit here. Or, or, sure, Nicole. Let me, I'll let Joseph tackle it, but I just want to say that um, my heart goes out the most in all of this to seniors. There's so much that like the stage of life that they're in that's, that's 
tricky for them. So I really feel, feel for them. But in terms of, you know, us making changes and adjustments to our academic criteria, we have, you know, um, accreditations that we, you know, we're kind of bound by things that we can't really make a lot of um, significant adjustments. However, we have appeals process. We have an appeals process. I know we have a scholarship appeals process. We have admissions appeals process. So that's something they could take a look at and say, you know, I've been unable to, to do this. So can I still be considered for admission or for scholarship because of my situation? And I think that's something obviously we're going to take on a case by case basis and look and take a look at that. Um, so I'll let Joseph take it from there, but I just, my heart really goes out to seniors. This graduating time of your life, fall semester on a college campus, some, some things are being compromised that my heart really goes out to you right now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine being a student athlete. I couldn't imagine my, my season being ripped away, but I understand um, this happened. No one could prepare for it, but there has been a, a beauty in this. And I guess it's all about perspective in that. Be, because a lot of uh, institutions have allowed for flexibility with test scores or certain course grades. And the NCAA has allowed instances where there's some increased flexibility in that regards. So a lot of institutions have looked at, you know, what is the total academic profile of a student um, as well as a student athlete, you know, and from the, from, in most cases, you can, you can get a good understanding of a student, student athlete based on, on their progression uh, throughout their academic uh, matriculation. So for example, if there's a certain test score that has not been reached, you, you can generally look at the progression and say, hey, this student athlete, you know, may be right here on the threshold, but given their historical background, they could probably achieve this or they could, you know, that transition from that high school to our institution would, would be an easy one. So a lot of institutions have just said, hey, we're just going to waive uh, test scores. Uh, I know a number of HBCUs have said, hey, we'll take what you have. We, we just want to get you, um, present you that next opportunity. So a number of HBCUs have allowed for that. Other institutions are saying, hey, we're going off your unofficial test grades. Or where were you, where was your progression at in the middle of that term? Um, if you've taken SAT, ACTs before or certain uh, state standardized tests, they've um, now considered those. Um, in instances where there has not been an SAT or SAT uh, uh, taken, there have, again, been some institutions that have allowed for, okay, well, hey, we'll admit you on a conditional basis. And when there's some kind of picture of when the next ACT, SAT opportunity presents itself, then, you know, you could, well, let you take that, but we'll give you some kind of admission uh, to the Senate. Because if I'm not mistaken, there was one test actually getting ready to occur when most schools started shutting down. And so that's a number of, of students um, overall, especially student athletes in, in our regards, because from an Ivy League in, institution standpoint, we're very big on standardized test scores. You know, the academic uh, piece is one thing, but those test scores are, are can make a difference in some regards. So there's been some flexibility in that. And so what I would do with for parents and students now, just to encourage yourself, hey, use this time to, to study and, and, and work on those test taking strategies, you know, do what you have to do to remove, remove that anxiety and take advantage of this. But, you know, in the midst of pan, pandemic, there's a, an opportunity for flexibility. So take advantage of it. Great. And what about um, reaching coaches specifically? So there's some concerns here with questions coming in about how do we reach the coaches and has there been some leniency around, you know, whether it's NCAA, NAIA, uh, or regulations, really, but has the rule book changed? Has the playbook changed? And uh, how do they get a hold of coaches? Yeah, so every week the NCAA presents a um, new you know, they get information all the time, but in real time, every week they send out a document, a Q&A to all of us administrators, it's open to the public as well, on questions that they've gotten, how to give us guidance on where they land on certain things. And they have allowed for some flexibility to, uh, for, you know, prospective student athletes to contact coaches during this time period and for coaches to give virtual tours. Again, if they're in, a, uh, if they're of recruitable age or um, in a recruitable period. So they can still contact those coaches. Again, most of their information is on um, these athletic websites. They're in, in the staff directories. Uh, they have their emails. Um, you can reach out to the, if a specific coach is not available, maybe their recruiting coordinator or an operations person can guide you in the right di um, direction. Of course, social media. Um, that's always a tool that a lot of student athletes um, utilize. Um, but yes, the NCAA has allowed for some flexibility for 
uh, individuals to be contacted. Okay, good. Uh, I would say um, I would piggyback off several of the points that Joseph just made as far as uh, admissions for our different membership schools, having flexibility and um, changing and flexing their separate admissions criteria. It is on a school by school basis, but we have been hearing uh, a lot of conversations around that decision making and, and taking COVID-19 situation into that factor. Uh, same for NAI, I would say, uh, as far as what Joseph touched on for contacting coaches. Um, our coaches are really utilizing uh, virtual platforms, Skype, Zoom, um, email, et cetera, and in replace uh, of that general like on-campus uh, visit. Um, I'm gonna go back just for a moment here for the seniors uh, graduating for high school. Uh, so for and this is, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, NAI Eligibility Center Clearing, so admissions uh, from school to school could still differ, but the, the biggest change and exception we've made around that uh, due to the SAT and ACT tests being canceled is essentially we've put into place with our National uh, Eligibility Committee a blanket exception for fall 2020 freshmen. So essentially uh, where I discussed earlier, you had to meet two of those three uh, eligibility requirements as a freshman, this for this current term, fall 2020, all uh, NAI freshmen will need 2.0 uh, and they will not need class rank or SAT or ACT. So essentially we're taking that final uh, senior transcript once you've graduated your cumulative GPA, if that is a 2.0 or above, you will be eligible on campus. Um, there's different details uh, and additional requirements you need to meet once you've gone through that first semester, but that is the, the general exception that we're taking. Okay, great. Right. Right. And, and Nicole, I know you mentioned um, some add-on sports, which is great to hear at Southern Utah. Uh, what about sports in general? Like, what have you all heard behind the scenes? Is it that there are going to be certain sports that we can expect to fall off? Um, what are we to expect this fall in terms of just sports in general? Is football going to get started this fall or is it a wait and see approach? I mean, right now I just was on the athletics homepage and it's like fall 2020 season tickets, get yours now. So I think we're hopeful right now. Um, like I said, we're in a rural part of Utah. Um, it's an outdoor stadium, fresh air. I don't know if there will be social distancing, masks, certain measures and things taken. Um, but I would assume that if um, our face-to-face -face classes happen this fall, I think some form of football will also happen. Um, I don't know, that's just my opinion and the website looks hopeful. Um, I think we have a lot of things going for us, going in our favor here, but we're also trying to be careful, so. Yeah. Joseph? Well, I'm completely biased to football, so. <laughs> my answer is when it comes to that, I, I'll be the first one to say that. Um, but that's this one of the things, there's no precedence for, for this pandemic. So we, we don't have the answers. And, and it's, it's sad, but it's one of those things we've had to good, get good at telling coaches and just parents and everyone, we just don't know right now. Our, our answers have changed. I remember when this first hit, we would tell our coaches, we'd give our coaches guidance on one subject, and then by the end of the day, we'd have to give them guidance on another thing. And by Wednesday, it was like, hey, you can't do it all together. And so it, it's, we're just flowing, as if you will. It, this is a real fluid situation. We really just don't know. Um, there are models out there for football, fall sports to come in the fall with so certain social distance guidelines, but we don't know that. That's just things that they're looking at, but essentially we just don't know there because that varies by states. You have, you know, individuals coming from different countries who have, you know, opened up their borders and allowed them to travel and things of that nature. We, we just really don't know. I, I do hope and pray that we have football. I, I can't imagine not watching football and, and being on the sidelines. It's been a while since I've played, but just being in that atmosphere um, I feel as though we have to have it. Um, being here at, at, at my current institutions, I've gotten exposed to lacrosse and, and different sports that I had no idea before, skiing, things of that nature, sailing. 
And so I'm eager to get out there and, and experience those just as much as I am football. But again, the biggest thing is we, we just don't know at this time. I would say something exact for NAIA. Um, it's such a fluid situation. It's just changing um, day to day, hour to hour, sometimes minute to minute. So we are in constant communication with our memberships. Um, we are certainly hopeful uh, and our goal is to have all fall sports uh, continue as usual as well as hold those fall championships. Uh, we're still circula circulating around that uh, July 1st decision date, um, but just nothing is 100% is certain. When you mentioned, like, what have you heard? I will say I have heard, this is from a elementary school teacher out of California. Go back in the fall, the flu season hits again, it'll be worse, so we'll go online in December. So that's something I've heard. I have no idea. Like Joseph said, we just don't know. But if you want the scuttle, that's one thing I've heard. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and, and there's so many, you know, this is so much uncertainty for everyone, student athletes included. I know that one of the questions that's coming up for student athletes is how do they stay top of their game? How do they make sure in a time of physical distancing when they can't be with their team, they can be outside shooting hoops in the driveway, but that isn't the same as taking that individual coaching from your coach and practicing as a team. So we have a lot of student athletes that are worrying how this physical distancing and the lack of ability to practice their sport um, individually with their coach and as a team with with their uh, fellow players any tips on how they can stay top of their game <laughs> when they can't be with their team right now yeah so the NCAA has allowed for you know, current student athletes to you know have some kind of athletic related activity going on on a volunteer basis so um, there's been some legislation that's been put out for them to say, hey, if you want to have chalk talk or film review, you can have X amount of hours in doing so. And, um, and coaches take advantage of that time. Um, they have unlimited when it comes to, you know, just checking out their mental health and well-being. But again, going back to our earlier point, it's using technology and, and just being using that ingenuity. Um, I know a number of, of strength and conditioning coaches have put workouts on YouTube in, in various different realms, and they've shared it open to the public. You know, I, I, our coaches, you know, they send it to uh, YouTube, and I know everything from our senior administration to uh, specific uh, student athletes take advantage of those workouts at home. I, I know myself, I, I body build, so I'm just like you all. I need a gym ASAP, <laughs> so, but you've had to use that ingenuity. Um, to take advantage of that. Uh, there have been a number of things on YouTube or different social media accounts that, that will put you in different scenarios to kind of give you an idea. Of course, you know, when it comes to certain things, there's nothing like that one-on-one -on -one skill training and skill instruction. There's nothing like being in certain uh, situations where you can gain that situational awareness. Um, but it's, it's just something that you, I, I have to encourage individuals, whatever your sport may be, is to to use that ingenuity, get real good at being creative. You know, back as when you were a child, you know, using your imaginary friends, you've got to go back to the basics on a lot of those things. You know, run around the garage, you know, throw pine cones, whatever you have to do, just get real good at using that ingenuity. You know, set your teddy bears up that are in the attic and, and put yourself in certain situations, whatever you have to do, just get real good at, at, at communicating. Nicole or Danielle, anything to add to that, how students can stay top of their game right now? So I think some of this is from a perspective, sorry, of like my daughters are in dance and they've been doing dance from via Zoom and it's been really difficult, really challenging to be connected. And so it's almost like I would say work on your mental like well-being. Mm. That's just so much as important, um, strong and important to our bodies. They're so connected. And so just getting fresh air, getting outside, getting physical activity, um, and just trying to stay mentally strong so that you, that you have a desire to want to, you know, kind of continue to push forward and work towards your goals. So that's my, I don't, I'm not a big athletic family over here, but that's what we're trying to do is just to kind of take our physical, but also our mental and try to stay strong there. That's great advice. Yeah, I, think, I think those are, are both great answers. I would say take advantage of those virtual platforms in whatever form that may be for, for both of those, for your um, 
for your mental health, uh, a lot of teamwork can fall to the wayside and that kind of camaraderie when we can't be face to face. So maybe if it's not even you're virtually practicing on the athletic side, maybe you're just uh, doing a Skype or a Zoom, something like that with, with your coach, with your teammates, uh, just checking in on each other and, and kind of feeling uh, that, that sense of togetherness as, as much as we can in these times. Uh, and then also on the athletic side, uh, get creative, whatever you can do. Uh, if it helps to do push-ups with a teammate over Zoom, I would go ahead and take care of that uh, um, on the virtual platforms. Great. Uh, Say, one of the things that our coaches I know are taking advantage of is just whatever mental stimulation that you can do, make sure you're doing that. And so whether it's playing video games with each other for 30 minutes on end, but being intentional about the video games that you play. Of course, you may want to play Call of Duty for hours on end, but no, play, you know, this kind of game that puts you in kind of situations that remind you of it. So one of the things is, you know, take FIFA. They'll play, you know, FIFA, but run their offensive strategy. They'll run their defensive strategy. And it, it kind of stimulates them. It, could, it puts them in game time situations. Again, it's, it's, it's just being real creative. But one of the big things is I would say there are a number of webinars floating out around there, especially something like this. Take advantage of those. There are a lot of mental health strategies that are being taken out. Um, do something as simple as uh, one of the challenges um, that an organization I'm part of uh, is, is call for individuals each week and, and let that mental health check, you know, stimulate you. And then you'll see that reflective in, in, in a number of things. And of course, I always encourage individuals, make sure you're reading. Read at least 30 minutes a day, um, whether it's about your specific sport or whether it's about a subject that you're interested in. Just make sure that your, your mental fortitude is, does not uh, go on the wayside in the midst of all of this. Yeah. And that's such great advice. I, last, our last webinar was actually on the topic of mental health and resilience. And I think there's such a powerful connect with what the three of you are saying in today's webinar and, um, you know, planning for future and the, how we think about things, our, our perspective really shapes how we manage what's going on in our life. And, and thank you so much for making that connection. A couple of questions uh, from parents around recruitment and, and their concern um, getting, getting a hold of coaches. So I submitted my son's athletic profile to many coaches through NCAA, email, call, but no response. How do I reach them? Swimming coaches. Keep at it. Trust me. Keep at it. Proactive yeah. recruit it. Yeah. It's, it's really what it is. Understand that you are one, literally one in a million individuals. So if, if coaches are anything like me, they have a million emails. As soon as they check one, they have 300. As soon wow. as they you know, spend their afternoons kind of clearing that box out by eight o'clock the next morning, it's full. And so one of the things that, that, that coaches say, that they can only hit it when they come. So just that resilience, it comes out. But at the same time, there has to be something to se separate you from the crowd and that's and i say that from a student standpoint more than i do student athlete standpoint there has to be something to set you out so you know again when you're looking at the profile of a student athlete how are they going to fit on your team you know what is making them stick out besides they have this ideal 6'4 250 pounds chisel running a 4'4 okay but how does that translate to how they can help this institution more so how can I can invest in them so they can be a model citizen moving forward. Um, so uh, again, how are you emailing them? What, are, what is in your message? Are you just saying, you know, it's, it's in your delivery. You know, some people is just sending an email with a, a huddle link. Well, that's not telling me anything. That's, that's not sticking out. So just, you know, it's almost like an interview. You have to do something to stick out. And it's more than athletics. And again, I understand these are athletic questions, but it's bigger than athletics. The emphasis has to be on the student aspect and, and the academic um, curriculum. Focus on, you know, hey, what are your test scores like? What are your community service look like? What, what kind of organizations have you served in? You know, during this, this epidemic, have you, you know, made masks for underprivileged kids in underprivileged communities? What have you done to stick out? And then if you've done all of that, you know, then when coaches are finally able to get to your email, they don't just see someone just trying to get a scholarship. They see someone, okay, 
this, this, this person, yes, they may be able to run a 4-4, but they have leadership qualities. They are doing different things. You know, I, I see the question of what is the recruitment age? Well, recruitment age varies by sport, but generally it's from the ninth grade. And so starting from ninth grade on to your matriculation through high school, what have you done since then? And, and does your performance match what you've done? You know, from an Ivy League standpoint, that's just one big thing. You know, as I said, we, we look at test scores, but again, how are you going to fit into this institution? What is going to separate you apart? Um, you know, in, in AIA, as Danielle spoke on earlier, they're smaller. They're, they're, their emphasis is not on athletics. It's, it's, it's about, you know, a faith-based institution. So that model of, uh, of a student athlete or student and their profile. And whereas, you know, an NCAA institution may be looking at a more macro scale. What are you doing to stand out? And it may also be that the coach, um, due to rules and regulations, may not be able to respond, correct? Depending on where they are in the cycle. That's true. Um, so, for example, right now during a dead period, coaches can't actively contact uh, certain people or do certain things, but they can be contacted. And so, you know, there may be a situation where they can't call you, but they can respond to your call. So reach out. Um, if in instances where, hey, they find out where they, that they can't, they have that flexibility to say, hey, I can't talk to you at this time. I'll be able to talk to you at this time. Um, but again, there has to be initiation more so on the potential student athletes and then uh, the other way around. I love what Joseph says about kind of drawing that picture, helping articulate how you fit into the community, into the campus community, um, the strengths that you bring holistically to, to the campus. I love that. That's a really unique way to sell yourself. Um, and I would also say just be persistent, be consistent with reaching out. Yeah, I would just quickly add, um, Joseph made a really great comparison. It's, it's like a, a job interview. Um, if your employer has a, a stack of resumes on the desk, how is yours going to stand out? Uh, why are you a good fit for this uh, athletic team, this uh, institution? What makes you uh, different from all the other applicants? Uh, and then again, I would piggyback and say, continue reaching out. I would say these last two months where a lot of students have likely tried to contact those coaches, everything was, has been so up in the air and there's just not answers um, for the future, let alone what coaches and, and students and administrations were doing for that current uh, day or week within the spring 2020 term. So um, there's still a lot of unknowns, but I think uh, as we get a couple months into this and you know we're in our new normal, if you will, uh, if, you're, if you keep at it, keep contacting, I think coaches will continue to be um, more likely uh, and um, have more uh, decisions made on their end of, of what they can do uh, and continue with rec rec recruitment. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Do you wanna to briefly touch Joseph on uh, NCAA language requirement, two years of the same language, level one and two, or can it be level one of two different languages? And several states don't allow reclassified Canadians. Why is that? So from the, the last uh, Q&A and the guidance that we received that they're still looking into those uh, situations. So uh, were situations where uh, an international student took all international classes and then took no English uh, classes from an American institution. They're looking at that conversion and then, you know, different situations as they vary. Um, the NCAA has allowed for a lot of interpretation on that. They haven't specified how that'll swing, but a lot of that is, is, is still been given flexibility to allow for blanket waivers um, or, or blank, blanket academic qualifications based on the, the historical um, uh, academia that they've seen so far. Okay. Okay. But, but still, I'm sorry, but to answer your question, yes. So they're still looking at the English, the math, the science, other core courses as it would translate to uh, an institution. 
Okay, good. Great. Well, a lot of great questions here. Ooh. I think we're going to need to pull these together and <laughs> send them in an email. I was uh, just thinking that the questions continue to roll in. So Joseph, Danielle, and Nicole, <laughs> I'm hoping you'll be okay with us touching base with you after the webinar so that we can get some of these answers out in our follow-up emails. So that's a great suggestion, Joanna. <laughs> this was a hot topic today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lots of questions. Wow, covered a lot of ground. And before we wrap up and get you all to give us one final tip, I'm just going to share the screen for a moment so people can see what we've got coming up and how to get in touch with our incredible guests. So if you want to get in touch with Nicole, Joseph, or Danielle, the information will be in your follow-up email, and we've got it here on the screen. So please reach out, visit their websites. Um, we will be sending answers to questions that have come in following this when you get the recording. And as always, every Wednesday, noon Eastern time, we're here with a different topic. Next week, we're talking about US college applications, the, um, the, the process of applications. And we've got a couple of incredible guests. And then of course, these are the, the rest of the series. And you can find out more at Prep Skills learn.prepskills.com. And if you want to book a call with Joanna to learn more about um, how they can support you in this process, there is a link that you can see on the screen and we'll make sure that we send that to you uh, in the email. We always love to close with a final, um, with a final statement from each of our guests. It's sort of a one-sentence one tip. And the question that I'll ask you to give us your one-sentence tip for is thinking about um, helping student athletes uh, be successful. What final success tip could you offer to student athletes, their coaches, or parents uh, to help them with their success? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, okay. I think it's important to let your uh, resourcefulness and preparation uh, guide you. I think that that'll be your new playbook moving forward. Great. Thank you. I would just say, um, as we all need in this time, patience, just to be patient with um, the process and the situation as it evolves. Mm -hmm. Also, don't use, don't let the situation um, kind of change how you would proceed. Like Joseph talked about, we've got to be creative. We've got to be ingenuitive about how we approach this, but still visit, like you'd be visiting colleges and universities. You'd be researching them. The things that you normally would be engaged in still do those things, but utilize the technology and the resources that we have available to us to, um, to take a look at what's going to be the best fit for you, taking a look at the bottom line, to um, reach out and be a WhatsApp or call a Zoom with the reps that you need to speak with. Um, because although a coach might not be reaching out to you, someone in the recruitment office, the admissions office could speak to you and answer your questions and kind of help, help a little bit there. So find the, the resources you have available to you, use those, be patient with us, but also be proactive and um, kind of try to carry out this process as you normally would with technology and the resources available to us. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. And Danielle, your success tip. <laughs> uh, a lot of the same as, as Nicole stated, um, resources, get creative, ask for help. Um, this situation can certainly feel so isolating and in so many different ways and forms. Um, and know that you're not the only one going through it. We expect you uh, to ask for that extra help, and that's what we're all here for, uh, as well as coaches, uh, admissions, counselors from various institutions. Um, we're, we're all going through this together, and we all need a little help. So whatever you need, reach out, get creative with your resources, and just try to stay positive all around. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'll just echo all of that. Connections and relationships are so important right now, and they will definitely carry you through. Danielle, as you said, we are all in this together. That's one of the reasons we created this webinar series is to bring people together to get the many questions answered and to support parents 
and students in planning their, their academic future. So thank you all for joining us today and for your questions and great questions. We look forward to continuing to get more information and answers out to you. And to our three incredible guests, Nicole, Danielle, Joseph, thank you so much for your transparency today, for answering some very difficult <laughs> questions and for these incredible nuggets of wisdom that you've offered us to really help students and their families and coaches. So thank you so much. And Joanne, as always, a pleasure to work with you and thank you for everything that Prep Skills is doing to help students find their future. Thank you. And could we just hear one final tip from Joseph? I don't oh, think sorry, I missed Joseph. Yeah. <gasps> sorry about that. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is do or do not. There is no try. And so one of the things that I will encourage you all is do it. Whatever it is, do it. Be consistent about it. Be vigilant about it. Um, be, just, just do something, you know, whether that is contacting your coaches, whether that's getting out there and taking a walk. Um, be patient in everything you do, but be consistent in everything that you do, um, especially given this time. It's all about perspective. So some where some may say, oh, my life is ruined. No, you know, hey, this I presented with this new opportunity. So take advantage of that perspective and just go out and do something. Perfect. I love Thank that. you. Just do it. Step into action. I love that, Joseph. My mom has a little sticky on her fridge that says, just do it. We grew up with that. So <laughs> I just love, love, love that tip. Thank you all so much. And Joanna, did you have anything you wanted to say before we wrap up? No, I think, uh, you know, thank you. Um, I think there's still some questions and they're yeah. still coming through. Uh, we're going to, we're going to compile the responses to those questions, send them to parents, feel free to, to get in touch with um, prep skills. Should you have questions about the admissions process, uh, SAT, ACT, all that fun stuff. We're here to support you. Wonderful. And again, thank you so much, Danielle, Nicole, Joseph. That was incredible. Great to be with you today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Charmaine. Take care. Stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank you.